Let's soldier on, as our vice chair likes to say. Um, okay, so, um, so we are talking about Act 250 amendments that are currently in S226. Um, next, in Section 2D, uh, it's looking at the Criterion 1D, which was one of the last sections of 511. It does use different language um, than what is in 511. Um, it is not. It is not proposing to change the definitions. Um, however, it is adding a new provision starting on line 11. Um, and I do think this is probably related to housing. So Criterion 1D is used for any permit um, under Act 250 review. It's asking the permit applic applicants to look at flood hazard area, floodways or um, fluvial erosion areas or the floodway fringe. And so down on line 11, notwithstanding mm -hmm. subdivisions one and two, within an existing settlement, uh, which is a defined term in Act 250, a permit shall be granted if all occupied space is elevated or flood proofed at least two feet above base flood elevation or otherwise designed to be reasonably safe from flooding. Um, this is a this is a um, uh, this is different than what is currently in the statute. Um, currently, the statute asks that if you're going to be developing in one of these areas, you have to demonstrate that you're not going to be um, restricting the flow of the floodwaters, um, causing endangerment to health and safety and you'll not contribute to or increase the discharge during a flood. So this is actually adding like an extra um, sort of um, almost escape hatch provision saying, notwithstanding if you might restrict or divert flow, um, a permit will be granted if all occupied space is elevated and flood proofed. Does that mean, I mean, we're going into other committees jurisdictions probably, but does that mean that you could build um, and it says it shall be granted. So uh, I'm thinking that someone could get uh, a permit just if they meet those requirements, regardless of whether there are other adverse impacts. I mean, if you redirected, yeah. if you redirected the, the river and it flooded another area, it seems to read, well, I don't care about that other area. I got my permit. Yeah, I do have concerns that this would potentially interfere with other criteria. Um, so if you want to pursue this language, we, I might want to try to sync it up with some of the other criteria in the statute. But yeah, this is pretty strong language. Okay. Yeah, and shall might be met. Yeah. I hear that. No pride of authorship. Don't want to cause a lot of undue damage. Just a first run through. <laughs> so. Okay. And so this is um, a section Senator Ram Hensdale hinted at before, uh, mitigation of primary agricultural soils. So currently under Act 250, um, if an application for a construction project is going to impact primary agricultural soils, um, there is a requirement that they mitigate that impact. Um, primary agricultural soils are mapped um, and uh, applic the Agency of <clears throat> Agriculture, <clears throat> excuse me, does administer this part and does weigh in on this when um, an applicant is going to uh, reduce or destroy agricultural soils. So this, so currently under that program, um, an app, depending on where the project is going to be located, an applicant may need to do on-site mitigation, which would require the, um, the applicant to either change the shape of their project to avoid the agricultural soils or reduce the size of it. Um, it, it does refer to sort of physically altering your project to avoid destroying the soils. Um, there is However, in uh, designated areas, so within the downtowns, gross centers, new town centers, and NDAs, um, the applicant does have the option to instead do offsite mitigation, 
which is essentially paying a fee based on the number of acres of soils that would be destroyed. Um, and that fee then goes to VHCB, who would then purchase and conserve um, similar um, land elsewhere that should be protected for agricultural use. Um, Anecdotally, some of the developers prefer to use the offsite mitigation because it's a, it's a calculation they can do and they don't have to alter the dimensions of their project. But there are, there are pros and cons to both methods. Um, and so this is making an amendment here that, uh, um, yeah, so it's extending that, um, this protection, this option for on offsite mitigation, so the payment of the fee is being extended to neighborhood development areas in village centers and new town centers because currently it's only allowed for those around downtowns. So that's what one. The, what, what is the date change? Does that mean that they, they're, they've allowed sort of a grandfather clause and we're getting rid of that so now um so i think this provision was added in 2013 and so at the time there were already existing new town centers and this would be moving moving and so it was moving forward um this would this would be allowed this is striking that requirement and saying any new town center um there currently are still only two new town centers and i don't actually know off the top of my head the date of their designation. So it's just, I think it's just removing that sort of date requirement that was initially required. Okay. Um, and then additionally, still in this, um, so on page 15, for a priority housing project or an alternative or community wastewater system, Located in a designated area, the per the ratio so the ratio shall be one to one, um, and so this is for the calculation of the mitigation. Um, for all other projects currently, the calculation is based on a number of factors, and the Agency of Agriculture works on this with the district commissions to do a calculation for. Um, how much agricultural soil needs to be protected. It's usually somewhere between two to one to three to one. And so this is lowering it to one to one. Um, and then finally, um, in this section, there is a mitigation flexibility provision. So for, uh, I believe this is for, again, the designated areas. Yeah, so for designated areas, um, the district commission who's working on the application has this mitigation flexibility to allow a combination of both on-site and off-site mitigation. Um, and this is striking that provision um, so that the default will just be off-site mitigation. I'm not, okay. So does this promote more development or? It seems like it's restricting the flexibility, right? Um, it's striking the flexibility so that um, the district commission can't require the on-site mitigation, which would require the shrinking of the project potentially. Um, so it would just say, district commission, you have to, you are required to assess um, the off-site mitigation, which is just a fee that is paid by the developer that then goes to um, BHCB, as opposed to saying, the combination of a fee versus um, shrinking the project. So this is this liberalizes development, I think, right? By striking this. P potentially. Yeah. Okay. Potentially. Yeah. Uh, it 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 expands opportunity. Okay. Yep. Okay. I think this is the last section. I'm on page 16 of S226. Um, back to Title 24 in the municipal bylaw section. Right. Oh, yes. So this is the 
Um, on a complete on a completely different note, this is a requirement that essentially would get rid of um, single family zoning. So we're in the zoning um, bylaw section, and we're striking language regarding um, requiring towns to include multi-unit dwellings somewhere in the town. And we're adding language here that says, in any district that allows residential development, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting multi-unit or multi-family dwellings. Okay. So I think we had this in one of our bills and we watered it down somewhat to something to deal with the character of the neighborhood. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. yeah. So no. Okay. No. Kind of. So you in S-237, there was a proposal to um, allow duplexes um, ubiquitously in, but only in designated areas. This is for any town with zoning um, has to allow multi-unit or multi-family dwellings in all of their residential zoning areas. They can't restrict multi-unit dwellings to specific zoning districts, which is how the law currently works. Okay, what, what did we, what did, something did get enacted with dealing with this, with the character, something about? With the character of the neighborhood. Yep, so currently towns are allowed to um, require conditional use permits for multi-unit dwellings. And you did add language that said um, they cannot deny a, a conditional use permit for multi-unit dwellings based on character of the area. Okay. And do you recall, was there a middle ground between that which passed and this? Uh, this is obviously very strong. I, I will we'll get into this. I'm sure there's going to be some objections. To, did we start out with something and compromise with the house or something that was in this kind same context uh, that we had proposed something more than just the character of the neighborhood, but less than this? Um, so off the top of my head, the only, the only provision again was the allowing of duplexes in every district. Okay. Um, as opposed to this, this is any size um, apartment building or structure. You did have language regarding allowing duplexes in any in any residential district. Okay, so you, you read this to be that a town couldn't uh, have, a, have a, a zoning law that said duplexes are allowed in any zone, uh, but anything more than a duplex could be prohibited in a zone that would that would, I just try to understand what this language means. I, I sort of read it initially that if they allowed for duplexes, it would meet the, would meet this language. So that um, is a fair point. Multi-unit and multifamily, multifamily aren't defined. Um, but I do think the statute, and I can double check on this for you. I do think the statute also uses the phrase, uses the word duplex. And so I do think it's a difference. We we can add definitions if you want to be more clear here. Well, um, I mean, in the most, in the, in the broadest reading of this language, I guess if somebody wanted to go into what is now zone one acre for a single family and said, well, now this law passed, so I'm gonna build a high rise in there and you can't, stop me because all multi-units are now, you can't prohibit any multi-units. So, I mean, I think that we're not, I don't think we're trying to suggest that. We just, I think we're trying to say, you can't have single family. You gotta have, allow something more than that, but not anything. Right, I, I, I would agree with that, Mr. Chair. We don't want anything, but we certainly want more density. And multi implies more than a duplex, in my humble opinion. But you're right, Ellen, we haven't defined it. Okay. And we'll need to. Okay. So this, 
and I, and then so I I agree it, it maybe isn't the perfectly clear I would also add though that it didn't get rid of the um, requirement that a town could add a conditional use permit um, like we just talked about with the character of the area so they still might have the option to um, require some permitting but they couldn't fully prohibit okay so Ellen it's you it's the witching hour 10 30 so yeah do we let you go sure and so just just quickly, the last page of this is um, okay. the tap. This is a task force as opposed to hiring a consultant. But again, it is asking for a review of the designation program and and updating it. Okay. And Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Clarkson. Is Chris with, still with us? No, Chris he is said, left. He said he'll oh. be back at, at ten thirty. I I've, know this. I've rejoined. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I would hope that actually, as we go through this, that we would expand this to be a, a, a task force that would look at all the designation uh, programs uh, in, in housing, just because I think, just as I mentioned earlier, you know, why are we adding more programs instead of expanding the jurisdiction of one we have that everybody can apply for that's eat, that don't seem to be as many challenges with. So I, I actually think, I think this is near and dear to Chris's heart doing a, a review of all the designation programs. Isn't that correct, Mr. Cochran? Yes. So I would hope if we go forward with this aspect that we would include all the designations okay. and designated programs. Great, Ellen, thank you so much. Um, you are welcome. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Good luck. <clears throat> okay, uh, is, is David with us? He is. Um, Okay, so David, uh, help me out here. Uh, are there parts of this bill that you have drafted at all? <laughs> yeah, there are a few. Um, okay, can we go through those? I think yeah. section three, beginning with section three, maybe. Well, I think we could begin with section one if we're still talking about um, 226. 226. Um, you know, I, I, I know you all, you, you've been around a long time, you know how this works, but I, I'm sure it must remain frustrating for you to think in your minds, you know, uh, housing and see my face and then I show up and I have to tell you that I don't know what's going on with 90% of what you're discussing. And I'm, I'm sorry for that. That's a silo problem. Uh, and, and, and just like state government is divided, just like committees of jurisdiction are divided, you know, our office is divided and there are so many overlaps actually, uh, have identified yet another attorney who has worked on a part of this bill, uh, which is Damien. So <laughs> I'm going to do my best and, um, and, and, and I'm going to try to help as best I can. I'm also going to tell you this, uh, of, of all the things that are you were discussing in the context of this, this omnibus housing concept, um, some of them have been around for years and are extremely well refined. And, you know, as some of the stuff Ellen talked to you about, you know, the difference is really the nuance and words right down to the word side of the page. Some of the other stuff, uh, goes to the completely opposite end of the spectrum and is just conceptual in nature. And, you know, I think you're at the, you're at the stage with some of these proposals um, where you're going to be talking about words and you're at the stage with some of these proposals where you're going to be deciding, do we want to explore this idea further? If so, we need to work on what it really means. And that's a lot of my stuff, unfortunately, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to take you through that and do the best I can. So, uh, Apropos of that introduction, section one here is this concept of municipal and regional land banks. And um, this came as a, a conceptual proposal from uh, the realtors. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly the name of their organization. I don't want to misstate that, but um, that's the source. The proposal didn't come with uh, bill language so much as a memo that sort of described what they hope to accomplish. I, I took that and created the language that's in this bill based on the ready districts. I don't know if you you remember working on ready districts, but um, that, these are the sort of the rural uh, economic development and infrastructure districts that 
were designed so that small towns could work together and create things for, you know, telecom, broadband, but could it be for more than that? Could be for other types of infrastructure and economic development purposes. So, you know, it, 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 as far as the words go, I, I'm not sure there's much value in trying to read through this language verbatim. I'll say conceptually a few things. Um, my understanding is that this proposal is modeled on uh, activities that are going on maybe in the Midwest where there is depopulation, there's vacant property. Um, and the, the answer in some places has been to authorize the creation of these regional municipal or regional boards that are quasi governmental entities. The purpose of which is to be able to identify, uh, acquire, and then just transfer uh, basically blighted properties or properties that are uh, underperforming, I, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for flexibility in here, but at the end of the day, this is a, 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 a this would require statutory authorization for one or more municipalities in some fashion to authorize themselves to create one of these land banks. And again, um, you would vest this land bank, whether it be municipal or regional, with certain powers. And that could mean things like priority for, uh, you know, purchasing properties that are up at tax sale, like they give an exclusive right to make a bid for the property if it's been foreclosed upon or there's been a tax sale upon it. Um, the authority to condemn properties, perhaps, and then uh, sell them or lease them. Um, basically, the, the purpose of one of these land banks would be to, again, identify and then do something productive with properties that are not currently productive. Um, there's a whole lot of details that would need to be ironed out, and there are problems like, um, you know, who's going to pay for this, who's going to do the work, what should be the basis of authorizing these groups? What power should they actually have? How much authority do you wanna give them? Do they need money? Um, should they get priority to, for these properties? Should they have the power of eminent domain? Um, what do they do with them once they have them, et cetera? And then, you know, liability issues like, what if the property is contaminated? It's a brownfield or it's a circular site, those types of things. Um, Lots of details, but that is the concept underlying the land bank. I'll stop there and see if anybody who else wants to comment on this. Uh, on this one, I think we will have the realtors in next week and have them defend this proposal unless um, I would assume that, uh, Senator Rahm, you're not in a full position to start answering those kinds of questions. So, uh, you know, I'd be very interested in hearing success stories and you know laws or programs we could replicate if at all if this is sort of not fully baked at this point it may be more than we can handle but you know as as i've said repeatedly the idea is to throw ideas out there whether they're whether they're in uh statutory form that's general or specific um, that will depend upon a case by issue by issue a proposal by proposal basis and whether we want to continue with it or not so I mean it's an intriguing idea I've in, I've, I've, in, I've I've invited everybody to to you know come up with creative ideas I don't know if the Vermont realtors can point to a, a municipality in Vermont that would want to take advantage of this. Uh, so there's a lot to be uh, discovered or explored in this area. And I think we should start with the people who have brought it forward for us. I don't know if you have any thoughts on yeah. that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll let Senator Clarkson speak up. I, the only thing I was going to add, I think that's exactly right. And as a curiosity and the possibility that it may be another tool in their toolbox, a few towns have reached out to me and I've copied the realtors just to say, let, let's get on the phone so I can hear you explain how this might add value 
to these towns and communities um, before they come in, you know, just because yes, a lot of towns are now intrigued um, to see if this does give them flexibility and, you know, some forward momentum um, on blighted areas, <clears throat> but, you know, wanna make sure I can't, I'm not in a position to defend it as fully as the folks I think have seen this operating right. from colleagues in other states. Yeah, exactly. So we'll have them in. I don't think we need to spend more time on, on that one, David. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and, and may I just add, Mr. Yes. Chair? Uh, yeah. Some towns are doing a version of this on their own. Um, and so I represent a couple towns that are already working on projects like this and creating opportunities for exactly this. And some towns are just having to do it by, or you know, by ordinance, you know, and by special referendum. And all. so there's a whole range of the way people are trying to get at this. Um, so I, I, I think beginning with the realtors is great, but we can also have some other examples testify of, of how they're handling solving these challenges. So you, you and I'll talk, we can identify some of the towns you're talking about and maybe have them come in as well. Okay, uh, moving okay. on. So I have received word, I've asked if it's okay that I push off my other committee meeting until 11 and I expect I'll need to be there for about 20 or 30 minutes and then I can come back. Okay. So we've, if that works for you guys, then I can try to do high level uh, overview type introduction to the concepts for 20 minutes and then I can come back to you at 1130 and talk about this and talk about 157 if that's okay. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you for suggesting that. Let's go. All right, so section three, uh, COVID-19 funding, housing, smart growth principles. Um, so th this is a, a pretty simple uh, section of uh, session law, but it's it's got a big point, which is this. There's all this money going out, uh, obviously hundreds of millions of dollars in housing money, planning money, uh, design and implementation work on and uh, on all these different components related to housing. And this section basically is a place to say, um, everybody who gets some of that money needs to the greatest extent problem um, uh, possible design and implement award funds that in a way to ensure that they are consistent with smart growth principles. And you know, some of those principles are listed here, compact, sustainable, uh, infill development, preserve open natural space, protect natural resources, uh, accommodate a variety of safe, affordable transportation choices, and expand the range of affordable housing. So, um, you know, obviously, this could be fleshed out and be more specific on how it would work. But I think, you know, people like DHCD, VHCB, um, <laughs> Uh, would have a lot to say about how this is implemented and what they're doing or not doing to be consistent uh, with the purpose, which again is to ensure that this money is spent in a way that promotes smart growth principles. So any questions? This is sort of like in some ways motherhood and apple pie, but um, I'm wondering, uh, is it just a question of timing uh, that we're talking about the, for the, I guess it's to the sponsors of the bill that we're talking about these principles applying to people who receive COVID relief funds as opposed to any other grant funds? Um, yeah, I'm unmuting <laughs> just to, um, I mean, I think, I think originally the overall impetus for some of these sections was hearing, you know, hearing um, the commissioner say, we just give us the money that is coming through the door from the federal government and we want to get it out. And this was a way to say, let's like put some guiding principles around that. Um, but I think you know, we, we don't know that we don't know the types of federal dollars we're going to get. And if they're labeled as COVID 
federal dollars. We don't know what money is coming. So I'm very open to like, is this too narrow at this point? It didn't feel that way like six months ago, <laughs> but you know, that's probably when we started drafting it. Okay. And may I just add, I, I, I'm assuming that all our uh, incredibly enlightened agencies who know so much more about housing than most of us uh, are already operating under this uh, value and under this principle. So there is no question in my mind that VHCB and DHCD, every, you know, everybody's operating under smart growth principles. But this sort of, um, I think, just w wants to say it out loud that, that any project that, and I, you know, I, I would expand it to any, you know, anyway, we mm -hmm. can discuss it, but any COVID uh, or, or, or build back better money that, but, you know, I think we should discuss that because really any, any major housing investment at this point should be being supported, should be supporting our smart growth principles, anyone. But mm -hmm. at this point in time, it is, I, I think just underscores that that <laughs> is what we would hope. Well, yeah, they are principles. I just get concerned and we'll talk more about if this section survives. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to know the legal ramifications. I mean, are we setting ourselves up for, you know, an individual citizen going to court and saying, you didn't uh, promote compact growth to the fullest extent possible. Um, words matter and mm -hmm. this is a statute. So, uh, you know, another alternative that might be a different approach and I don't know if it would be equally effective is to to have when these grants go out, you know, a, a template of some sort where, like we do for administrative rules, where they say how you've reached out to the public or how you've extended flexibility in this rule. And so in each case, they have to say, this is how we met these criteria. So at least they're forced to look at it, pay attention, but not necessarily uh, have a litmus test of whether the project could go forward or not. Anyhow, we'll talk more about it. So right. let's, let's move on. The next piece um, is uh, been around for four or five years, most recently, I believe manifests in each 93, the homeless bill of rights. And this is, um, you know, numerous sections, uh, rather than go through them each individually because they, they appear in different places in the statutes. But in a nutshell, this you're probably familiar with this, this is an anti-discrimination bill. And, and from work uh, and employment to housing, to places of public accommodation, uh, et cetera, the, the purpose of this is to say that you can discriminate against a person based on their housing status. Okay, so could you tell us, David, I know that we really haven't touched upon this issue in our committee, but I think there's been extensive work in Tom Stevens' committee. Uh, has there been, as far as you know, any discussion of this in that committee this year and how far did they get in previous years? I think that they, it was on their agenda this week. Um, <laughs> this is a bill that originally Luke worked on and uh, Luke has since, of course, moved uh, west and Damien has picked this up. So at this point, this is actually a Damien bill. Um, and the last I saw, he was on the schedule to discuss this with House General this week. And that's really all I know. Okay. So. So the only thing I would say is, I mean, Tom Stevens and I worked on this together in House General in 2011. Is that they right? certainly <laughs> picked it up, you know, more recently. And um, I think tried to uh, fine tune some of the sections that were a struggle for <laughs> shelters, et cetera. Um, and I let them know informally, the leadership of that committee, that this was in uh, the bill here. So that might, 
I didn't know that had spurred them perhaps to look at it again, to know that it's in conversation in both committees this time. Okay. Good. Uh, I apologize, uh, Senator Ron Hinsdale, for not being aware that you have been working okay. for it's much long longer ago. than 2017. I was just trying to do a quick uh, 2011. It, and it's come up in, in different, uh, as different bill numbers. So I think 93 is the most current one, but that could also be an error. Um, the next few uh, sections are each um, appropriations of federal COVID funds for housing related uh, purposes, whether incentives, support services, et cetera. Um, they are targeted at different areas. Obviously, the devil would be in the details and the dollars are something, you know, commit, that's what committees do. But as concepts, um, Section 5 relates to first generation home buyers, right? So this would be, as of now, it's, a, it's 5 million through DHCD to work in coordination with VHFA and other stakeholders to design and implement a program to provide grants not more than $10,000 for purchasing closing costs to first generation home buyers. Uh, so that's first generation home buyers. That's not the same thing as first time home buyers. And that's the distinction I want to draw here. So, uh, Senator Rahm, I guess, um, would this equally work in our downtown? down payment assistance program and add this money there with a carve out for first generation home buyers? Do we need to, uh, can we just, at least that program has defined mm -hmm. guardrails and parameters at this point. This is fairly open-ended. And if we didn't do a lot more work on this, we'd be in that situation where we'd be just giving money over with, um, and letting the administration design the whole program. This is sort of like a what we faced in like VHIP and other programs that got money but didn't pass into law. Yeah. I, I think you know there if if VHFA and Mara Collins come in to explain the the areas where they feel like there's a big gap in the current tools they have available then they might make the case and the committee might want to look deeper into this and make the language much more specific and functional to actually get to the people it's supposed to get to. I mean, this would mean 500, um, you know, grants for homeowners, but Mora would also be the first to say, it feels like with the first generation, uh, the first time homebuyer tax credit, it's smaller, it leaves a lot of people behind who don't have other generational wealth to draw from to fill in the to put the pieces together and this while we have the dollars let's make it a grant instead of a tax credit which also doesn't help everyone particular people who don't have generational wealth um so she uh i think could be a better champion for this knowing where the gaps are that she's been seeing okay. um but of course i agree with you we don't want the money to be set aside and then languish or not get to the right people. So we had talked about the details being really important. Eventually, how do you how do you determine a first generation home buyer? How much money is a, a solid amount for that person? And how do we get it quickly into the hands of people who are trying to buy their first home? Okay. Well, we'll definitely have more in on that one. And, and, and yeah, there are other parameters too to, to consider. So I, I look forward to having more, but I, I, I would always hope that this was done in concert with VHFA's other programs. So not to be created separately, but to enhance and, and create more opportunity within that program. Right. And for more people and maybe in, specific, yeah, anyway, there's, I think there's lots to discuss actually in this. Okay. David, what time did you say you had to? 11. 11, okay. He has six more minutes or seven more minutes. Okay, let's keep going. Sure, so section six, similar construct, uh, federal dollars through DHCD, and this would be working with VHCD 
and stakeholders. <clears throat> so this relates to manufactured home relocation assistance. Um, there's a lot more detail here, starting on page 29. So this is um, money to uh, for grants to help with moving abandoned homes, building you know code compliant uh, concrete pads for existing homes, um, and help with small scale capital needs for mobile home parks. Um, two uh, is grant funds for rehabilitating existing substandard homes. Um, you know, three and four sort of advocacy and marketing. Uh, components of manufactured homes and promotion and support of those communities. Um, five grants for common home repairs for sort of small scale, uh, you know, uh, just improvements that are necessary. Not uh, quite the same as um, rehabilitating substandard homes, rather helping with just the cost of, of maintenance and upkeep. Um, uh, the next piece, you know, uh, we're identifying and providing funding for gaps such as ADA compliance, um, uh, independent living accessibility, um, moving homes out of flood plains and other dangerous locations to new lots. Um, also in seven, um, you know, supplementary funds for flood resilient communities, it just gives grants to buy out of floodplains also, relocation services, new infrastructure for uh, new sites, um, eight down payment assistance and purchase of uh, high energy efficiency mobile homes to replace older homes. Um, Nine would be funding to parks themselves for, you know, basically park improvement um, and infrastructure, beautification, public space, road repair and maintenance, et cetera. So that money all flowing through DHCD and DHCB to help mobile home owners and mobile home parks in a lot of different ways. I'll leave it there. Great, thank you, uh, Senator Rahm, for pulling this together. It seems like uh, 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 touching upon a lot of areas of concern for mobile home, mobile home parks and mobile home, home tenants. Um, okay, let's keep going, we have about four minutes. Sure, um, seven is uh, money through DHCD to design and implement a program to provide matching funds on a per employee basis to employers with 25 or more employees um, when that employer is providing housing for its workforce. So this is basically a matching grant program to help uh, employers provide housing. I just wanna say when we say provide housing, that could probably be parsed a little bit more so it doesn't make it seem like we're incentivizing them becoming the landlord in any way, but knowing that a lot of larger institutions are trying to put money toward development where they know that their workforce could live without being the one holding the management or you know ownership of the property, um, and, or at least have articulated that this could really change the availability of housing where there's crunches due to institutions like hospitals and colleges. Do you, Are you familiar with any other state or municipality doing something like this and whether it was brought to your attention at all in the form of uh, a tax credit to employers mm -hmm. they can claim that they gave five thousand dollars towards uh, a deposit or a down payment and therefore they want to claim a credit i mean there's a lot of different ways of incentivizing this and i'm just wondering you know, it's, it's I obviously we all in this committee, I think like the idea of incentivizing relocated workers and part of the, the targeted targeting of that money goes to first month's rent, deposits and things like that. Uh, 
this could get some matching funds from employers, which I think is great. Yeah, we, I sort of just, I just started with the need, you know, that I heard that a lot of these housing crunches are in areas where there's an institution that, right. you know, has a lot of churn with people coming in and out and they would be interested in helping be part of the solution, but could use seeing the state put some skin in the game. So I, I mean, and you're, you're on finance. So, you know, if a tax credit <laughs> seems more, more feasible because it's, you know, a, but for kind of, we wouldn't have this development um, that, that could make sense. I just think, don't you know, ever, don't ever use the word, but for in this committee. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Yeah. No, but uh, no, I, I, we know like Bennington hospital is trying to buy units and yes, that's a great idea. If we can get partnerships with some of these things by offering some incentives, it's definitely worth considering. Yeah. Uh, I got about one more minute until I have to pop out and I can come back, um, but I'll try to finish up. Are you seeing section eight on your screen? Yep. Okay, so uh, this would be a commercial property conversion incentive. That's basically DHCD working with RDCs, RPCs, chambers, et cetera, to identify commercial properties that could be efficiently converted to residential use and provide grants on a per project basis to purchase rehab and convert those types of properties. Okay. Um, section nine is new American housing support services. So this is money uh, flowing through DHCD actually to contract with one or more entities to provide financial support, translation, legal technical services and other housing related services to Vermonters who are new Americans. Okay. Tiff is Bucky's, right? It is, and it is an extension of uh, some of the existing districts, and I'm not even going to begin to try to okay. explain Good. it. <laughs> Perfect. We'll let you go, David. Thank you so much. This has worked sure. out, just as I hoped, actually. So uh, let's, let's take a 10-minute break now, and we'll come back and hear from Chris if he's around, and then we'll talk about 157 when uh, David comes back, that's the uh, home uh, construction fraud bill and the house has now offered us an, a proposed amendment. Um, so uh, okay. see you at 10 minutes at 11.30. 